glorious morning. Makes me sick. Who disrupts my coronation? Everyone has been destroyed because of this freak. I won't allow it! These babies just saved this lame fest party! Guys, what's going on? You are listening to This Week in Geek.net. I am your host, and now a year older, Mike the Birdman. But I'm not alone as I travel through the weirdness that is the internet reality, such as we know it. I'm joined by my co-host, my compatriot, my best friend, my brother. Alex, the producer. Yay! We are back here here on Twigs. So hopefully you guys have had a fantastic week uh, out there enjoying this unbelievable week and of fall weather if you happen to live in southern ontario some of the nicest weather we have had in october at least to me in recent memory yeah. it was like, like it was like three degrees for four or five uh, this is celsius so just above freezing for a couple days and then the last two days have been 20 degrees celsius so what is that like 70 yeah like it's easily 72 right now uh in fahrenheit like i wore my hoodie this morning because when i left it was probably about 55 or 60 and then by the time i got down to the park it was around 68 then it got up to 62 or not 62 72 fantastic day uh overall so a lot has happened uh this past week some fantastic stuff uh as you guys often know we typically start the show by talking about well what's happened in our week so this past week i had my 44th or sorry 44th i'm aging myself my 40 what you're saying is you're, you you've had your first seniors moment <laughs> yes yeah basically soon i will qualify for that ihop discount so yeah uh this past week i turned 41 on uh thursday and what made this exceptionally special is my sister who lives in montreal drove in on wednesday night to surprise me so after uh me and blair went down to play pokemon go with with like all of our friends i come and there's my sister waiting for me so that was really 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 fantastic she's going to be down here for just a couple uh couple of more days i took her down to my favorite park in the world which is riverside park here in guelph we got some cool pictures it was actually pretty awesome um and then this week's birthday you uh came over um blair was there obviously katie and um my friend paul uh, also randomly came up and dropped off a gift too so he hung out this for about uh two hours And uh, it was just an exceptional day. I got like hundreds of birthday messages from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, a couple of text messages, FaceTimes even. And it was probably the best birthday I've had in easily 10 years. Like it was awesome. And it felt like so loving. And it It was was so, it was honestly a really relaxed and chill one. We, you know, it's the first birthday and for you in a while where it was like, wasn't a major health scare going on uh pandemic had wasn't like in full swing with lockdowns you had family around uh it was just very chill (laughs) yeah like it was nice so we uh sat around and we actually played one of the games i'll be talking about for review in this show i'll be talking about the jackbox party pack nine which i'll be uh doing so i played that with like all of you guys so it was brother and sister versus you two ass wipes um it was fun and offensive because i would expect 
no less. Um, and yeah. And then on Friday night, um, I went to the Guelph storm game as I most often do. And this was so unexpected. And I got to sh- send a huge shout out to the storm trackers fan club. I'm sure you guys are sick of hearing about this, but this surprised me. So I went down to go buy my $10 worth of, 50 50 tickets so the fan club uh vice president jordan comes over to to me and says hey mike can you come here for a minute i'm thinking yeah sure and he hands me a package and i'm thinking okay what did i do to deserve this is this like some sort of a <laughs> thing being served to you what, what did i do wrong exactly <laughs> oh god and what he did is he gave me a card for my birthday, but he also gave me a signed autograph picture of two Guelph Storm players who were traded from Owen Sound. So he went through the trouble of figuring out who are the most iconic Owen Sound players to come to Guelph. And one of them was just named the captain of the Montreal Canadiens. And I was oh, like, oh, that's my cool. God. Yeah, I was like, oh, my God, are you sure? And he spelled my name correctly. And I know that sounds like a small thing, but he spelled my indigenous name correctly. And that was just Friday night. And then the storm announced my name over the PA. I guess Blair had gone and like done that for me. So that was unexpected. And then uh, on Saturday night, um, I went down to the Storm Trackers. I hung out with them for a few minutes. We didn't win. We lost 4-3 in overtime versus Kitchener. And that's what, like, the official fan club? Yeah, and they've been around for, like, 30 years. I was so impressed by this. And they donate, like, a bunch of money to mental health organizations. They're working with the Shriners Club. Really good bunch of people. And... The one of the people who works for the Sleeman Center, her name is Lynn, came up to me and goes, hey, Mike, you've been with us for just over a month and change now. But when you are around the Sleeman Center, people look forward to seeing you. It's like you're a part of the family now. And I'm like, oh, my God, really? She's like, yeah, people really like talking with you. Like you're so friendly and so approachable. You bring just this warmth and energy And I want to ask you if you would be okay if we named you our fan of the game. And I was like, oh, my God, that was so cool. So they posted me on their social media, which I think has like 20 or 30,000 followers. And the fan club has been talking with me on like TikTok. And just this is the weekend where I have never felt more grateful for the things in my life than I have in an exceptionally long time. And before I get to you, Alex, I had an experience this morning. And the the only time I ever had this experience was the morning I went into surgery for my uh, bariatric way back in May. So I'm driving my wheelchair to meet Blair and Katie down at the park because they wanted to go grab coffee beforehand. And I'm driving down and a fox crosses my path like literally right in front of me and when i got my name uh earlier this year my spirit guide was determined to be the fox or in ojibwe you pronounce it wagush and i thought this fox was going to get hit by a car fortunately it didn't but my elder told me if this ever happens you have to offer tobacco because it will guide you to safety and comfort every time. And the fox saw me through surgery. So I figure seeing that fox is just an incredible moment that I have to acknowledge that how, something really good's going to happen. Now, for, for the ignorant like myself, how yes. do you offer tobacco? Uh, so what, what I do is you take a couple of leaves of it and you put it in your left hand and you find a place or a sacred tree or someplace that means something to you and you go out and you offer it to the earth and normally okay Okay. so it's not like you have to burn it in front of like like i I thought you'd have to like burn it and like smudge it it. but but say i could also smudge which i'm going to do probably tonight as well but normally because i'm in the wheelchair blair will do it for me but she okay. all we we have this practice of as long as you think of your intentions pure 
and my elder says, yes, that's fine. You are disabled. That does make sense. Creator gets it. And that's how we do it. And like I said, it's just a really transformative moment. I did not expect today. And coming into this coming week, I got a lot of things to do. I'm almost done my like college course. I've got a big doctor's appointment coming up in just over a month and change. It's time to get down the brass tacks, but you know what? Seeing that to guide me forward, I feel great, not even worried. So Mm. to lead off of all that, how was your week? Well, uh, (laughs) considerably less spiritual, (laughs) whether that be, uh, I guess, unfortunately less spiritual. I would love to have an experience like that, but uh, I... (laughs) I had a good time with you guys. <laughs> uh, it was mostly catching up on uh, movies and TV. I am still, still skipping record, repeating record, recovering from my uh, my knee injury, which I actually went to the doctors uh, to get my COVID bi- bivalent, bivalent, whatever yeah. they call it, the the new shot that does all the other uh, other booster stuff so i got that uh and then part of the meeting there was to get uh an increased dosage of metformin because as i mentioned diabetic now so they're like we're going to ease you into the normal dosage my sugars are actually pretty good uh and when i was there i had them check up my knee and they're like yeah you you bruise pretty good and you pulled the tendons and they're like you're a big guy so it's going to take you longer to heal so what would take somebody else like two and a half to three weeks they're like yeah you might be like feeling kind of sore till like november i'm like two months and they're like yeah (laughs) yeah just make sure that you stretch do stretches before you get up before you go to bed uh and then make sure you do like one flight of stairs so go check your mail upstairs at the uh the mail room and then like you know do that sort of stuff but don't over don't over stretch yourself so i'm like okay so a lot of it was like all right well this is an experience i'll just like catch up on all the games and stuff so uh as you'll see in this this show here i played the star trek prodigy supernova game uh, which is the the game the tie-in game for the new TV show that we uh, watched and were surprised at how good it was the first half of the season earlier in the year. Um, mm-hmm. And I actually thought that the whole season was over, but they're doing that thing where they split it into two parts. And the second part is starting up real soon, I think. Uh, so this is sort of bridging the gap between that. Uh, and then I also uh, played Gotham Knights, which uh, I had never played a single i played a batman game before or back in the day but i hadn't played any of the arkham games and i know that this is not technically an arkham game it's made by one of the teams that made the arkham games but it's not actually in the universe uh for that we'll have to wait for uh was it uh suicide squad kill the justice league so mm-hmm. uh you know i went into the, into this game and you'll hear in the review different than a lot of other people and that i literally had no point of reference this was like my entry point so that was interesting. Uh, I played a, a fair amount of that this past week. And uh, also I picked up one of those uh, Echo Dot. You know, it's like the, the Google Home. Like you've got a couple of Google Homes, right? Yeah. Well, they, you know, they, uh, the Echo is the Amazon version of that. But what they have that Google doesn't have is they have a version that has a built-in clock with an LED screen. Like it's like not like a full like like lcd screen but you know like individual lights that light up and, and think like those old scrolling signs you see at a grocery store or like a you know what i mean where it like it has advertising and, and like the red dots on it it's mm-hmm. like that only white dots uh, behind the mesh screen so i was like i'm gonna replace my alarm clock which to be honest has been kind of dead for the last six months to a year and i was only using my phone for it but i actually like having a separate clock that i can look at and i had actually picked up the fourth gen which was the last uh, version from two years ago when they clearanced it out about a month and a half ago and then decided I was going to give that to my mom. So that's going to be one of her Christmas presents. And I was like, I'll get the new one when that comes out. M- big differences, slightly bigger uh, slightly bigger speaker, and this has a built-in temperature sensor. So uh, I think I sent you guys a video to show when you ask it, you know, what's, uh, what's the temperature outside? Uh, it will, or you say, what's the temperature in my city? it will tell you based on, you know, the weather network, right? And it'll be like, oh, it's 19, you know, 0.2 degrees outside. But with this version, uh, it's the first time they've done it, you can say, you know, what is the weather in my room? Or sorry, what is the temperature in my room? And it will go, it is 21.2 degrees in your bedroom. 
And it's like, damn, that's good. So it's a way of, in my sense, I could be like, oh, you know, just because it's like, you know, say, say four degrees outside, I'd be like, well, it's warm in here. You know, what's it in here? Okay, I'll open the window a crack. And then in like an hour, I can be like, what's the temperature now? And then I'd be like, okay, close it. So it's like little things like that. So I've been playing around with that. I had it playing, <laughs> of all things, uh, elevator background music for like five <laughs> hours straight yesterday. <laughs> I had that on in the background while I was reading. I like had had open my uh, my uh, Kindle and I was reading books. And I'm like, I have officially become an old person. I'm <laughs> listening to Muzak. Like it's literally like when you think of elevator music or like um, department store music from the 80s and 90s and 70s and that. Mm-hmm. I was listening to that for five hours while I read novels. <laughs> like, wow you are older than dirt yes but it's, it was it was good so that's it's been pretty low-key that's what my week has been like uh obviously uh you know we've got halloween and stuff coming up so we're sort of ramping things up but i've been trying to be low-key because like i didn't want to obviously with my knee i didn't want to do too much uh mm-hmm. but i had a great time visiting with you guys it's always fun I, you know me i love birthdays like so instead of giving you a present with like you know one present i like giving a whole bunch of little things <laughs> yeah actually one of my favorite moments of my birthday and then we'll get into the show proper is you said well katie this is your brother congratulations you've been here for his ninth birthday because yeah. i got a lot of toys but it was yeah. pretty cool. well she missed your sixth birthday last year right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> with, with, so. I, I think it was was it six or three i forget we gave you a bunch of cards but <laughs> it's it, it, interestingly enough uh i got oh yeah and I'm, i also finally received my uh rpg books from uh renegade that i've been waiting on that i pre-ordered way back the the transformers one and the uh gi joe uh and i'm still waiting on some game master screens but it's getting to that point where it's time to start reading and getting ready so we can run some games that we'll have out over the you know holiday season and uh, i i I don't know if you shared exactly what gifts you got, but I found a couple cool little things for you so that when we get back into playing, we can play. I found you that cool. Have you seen the, the uh, D 20 glow in the dark yet? Uh, not yet. I didn't even think uh, to look at that, but I guess but when you, I go to bed tonight, I will. Cause I remember you said you used to have a big uh, D 20 and this is about the size of what, like a uh, slightly bigger than a golf ball. Ping- yeah. I'd say about the size of like a ping pong ball, maybe a, little bit bigger uh, about double the size of a regular d20 so you should be able to read that and then i found that challenge coin for you yeah uh and and you know what's really really funny i got home after we were at your place and there was another package at the door they sent me a second challenge coin so i'm keeping that one i only paid for one (laughs) makes sense man enjoy it so that's that has been my week buddy Fantastic. All right, guys, we got a lot of stuff to talk about on the show, though. We are only covering two stories in each segment. One of them, we can't not talk about this. It feels like this was a million years ago. If you can believe this was last week, we're going to be talking about the shutdown of G4 Tech TV again. But we're also going to talk about some funny things, including a brine filled death pit and why you don't attack sheriff's deputies with bees. If you've seen that meme, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where Oprah shoots bees at people. We'll talk about that. But first, we're going to take a look at one of Alex's reviews this week. We are going to take a look on who will take up the cowl and protect Gotham City. This is Gotham Knights. We'll be back, guys, right after this, only on thisweekingeek.net. I've been Mike the Birdman. He's Alex the producer. We'll be back, guys, right after this. Our friends over at Warner Brothers sent a review copy of Gotham Knights. Now, this is actually my first game in, I guess, it's not, this isn't officially uh, in the Arkham series, but by one of the teams that had done the Arkham games in the past. This is my first foray into that. I, for whatever reason, did not play Asylum, did not play City, did not play, what was it, Origins and, and Arkham Knight. I did not play any of those. That that was more of a Birdman thing. So for me going into this, it, it's a little different than uh, some other fans. And I know I've seen, starting out here, uh, there's been a lot of comparisons to some of the previous games uh, in the franchise. And there's been disappointment regarding some of the choices for atmosphere, uh, as well as presentation effects, that sort of stuff. And that 
a lot of the, the people that were super fans of this have complained that like, oh, it feels like a step back. It doesn't look like it's next gen. It doesn't. Look... You know what? Without seeing that in, in a vacuum in its own, like again, I haven't played those. I've seen the videos of them. I've seen a little bit of gameplay, and I'm like, okay, I can see where some people are coming from. Uh, me going into this, and I'm not, you know, somebody who's shilling for it or saying anything. Different. I went in completely blind, and I was like, this looks pretty good. I, I will say, as far as negatives that i can say towards it are i did notice i was like okay the character models look last gen i know this game was designed uh primarily for a long time as being a cross-gen game so that's why i went into that going okay i get that the characters as far as their faces their animations uh how they're lit how the the shadows work how they interact with the world feels almost 10 years ago it feels early to mid ps4 era um i did get this on uh the playstation 5 uh so i was kind of expecting a little more from the fidelity of the characters interestingly enough while it doesn't have a ton of the atmospheric effects that people said that they loved about the previous games uh the way the rain looks and everything it has a different visual style internally within the instance levels when you're in buildings it's much more uh, in line from what I can see with the previous Batman games and the Arkham games. But outside, I can see how some people are like, it's a bit of a step back, except that when you actually sit there and look at it, there's a lot of detail. There is a lot of high-def 4K visuals. Uh, there's uh, things look wet and, and murky, and there's, there's dynamic light, and especially the flow. It has frame rate drops now and then, but only when you're going up like really fast in one of your bat cycles or if you're uh grappling uh using your 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 grapple hooks to like go across uh fast long distances and for the most part it stays solid and things that are happening on one other side of the map like way far away uh are happening in real time that are while you're somewhere else in the map so when you get to there it's not like they just like there is a little pop in if you're getting you know really fast but it's not like they're not happening things are happening far away at the same time so i feel like it's loading a lot of the assets in all at once and it's sort of just calculating and doing things instead of like having parts of the map basically do nothing till you get close enough till they start it is already prefetching and preloading and doing things in the background so uh it does take a lot of benefit from having the uh the ssd and also some of the more advanced cpu and gpu features so that's cool. Uh, obviously, no ray tracing, or if there is, I, I couldn't tell if there's reflections or anything. I, it feels, it does feel like some of the technology being used is uh, a little last gen, except they cranked up everything to like brute force it to the max on the PS5. Uh, which, you know, I like the, the audio in it. Um, the voice acting is, I was, I, voice acting is fine. I would have liked if it was using the voice actors that I was used to back in the 90s that did all the cartoons, but it's clear they didn't go with that here. But the choices were well done, uh, and all the voice acting was competent, and I enjoyed it. Uh, this has the sort of... It is sort of like, like the tail end of the style of action character platformer action game of the last 10 years. This, you know, it's, it's not even apples and oranges to say that 75% of this game feels like it was inspired by or very, very directly close to the Spider-Man game that came out that was all the big rage the last couple of years. Uh, there are similarities in that a lot of the traversal is done through grappling and moving across. Uh, it is a little clunkier. I found that my frustrations with the game happened in two specific points. Sometimes when jumping from building to building, if you didn't aim exactly perfect and try to grapple at the right time you'd end up grappling to the building behind you instead of the one in front of you and that shouldn't happen it should be line of sight um and there was a section where i was going after clayface is which is one of the, the optional side bosses and side missions and there's a, a couple of these racing missions where you have to keep going straight forward and it felt like it padded itself out with being a little too difficult because if you it's one hit kills if you get knocked into something and it doesn't matter what your difficulty is. It was like, oh, come on. So outside of that, I got frustrated there. And I found a glitch where everywhere in the game, you have a recommended level. It's similar to uh, like Tom Clancy's The Division in that there's sections 
and levels in certain areas where it, they sort of say, hey, in this instance level, you should be recommended to be level 18 to 22 or something. And if you're level like 12, you're like, oh crap, I'm too low. In this game, if you're playing it on the lower difficulties, you can, for almost every part, be several levels below if you take your time and do it and you'll level up pretty quickly and you can get through it and beat the bosses even if you're at a low, like two or three levels lower than what you should be, even more sometimes. Except for the Mr. Freeze section. For whatever reason, I don't know if it's, how it's different. There is a, a boss battle with Mr. Freeze. You've probably seen the trailer for the first one. There's a second section where you're fighting him. And uh, I was like level, let's say, 19. I don't know the exact level at this point, but I was I was a few levels below what it recommended. And I was doing five damage. And it was doing nothing. I gained a singular level came back and started doing 150 damage it was like something on him on his defense or or some trigger there was something where it was like it was almost like a hard cap where it's like you have to be this level to do it and that would be fine if it was for everybody but it was only that one boss battle where i had trouble like that everywhere else i could be significantly lower level and find my way through it so i don't know there's some, there was a little bit uh, that's something that can be patched out later on it's just something that I really noticed, and uh, I was like, oh, this should have been cleaned up. Uh, as far as how the game functions, it's pretty optimized. I know there have been people that are saying, oh, the PC version, the crazy high requirements. Those requirements are because of how fast it, the game feels when you're playing it. Like, yes, it is 30 FPS, but because it's pretty much a, almost a lock 30, except for a few dips I'll see here and there when you're driving really fast, uh, it... It keeps its level of fidelity a fair bit. It doesn't seem to ever really get blurry while you're playing. Like, the level of details stay pretty consistent as I'm playing it. Uh, so, I had a pretty good time. I think it's about 30 hours. At least I put in, I think, 30 to 35 to do the whole game. I did all the side missions. Uh, I did a whole bunch of the extra missions that a lot of them repeat and you start over again just to help yourself level up uh, to do a bit of a loot grind. It didn't feel too grindy. There's a decent level uh, of variety when it comes to the side missions and the tertiary missions that you can do. Uh, I will say this. Uh, the game feels like it was probably meant to be a live service game, and they changed it into a single-player game with some co-op aspects later on, and there's going to be features and co-op stuff coming later because you can pick... The trailers initially made it seem like you're going to pick different characters for different missions, and you can do that. But you wouldn't really want to because once you've selected a character, you will gain blueprints and items to use for weapons and armor. And those don't tra track over to the other characters. So let's say you do two missions in a row and you've gained like four levels and you now have gear that's four or five levels higher on that one character. When you go to load the other characters for another mission, they do gain the same levels as far as experience wise, but their gear will be three or four levels behind. So it'll be actually harder to do that next mission that has a higher level requirement where your gear will be level three and the character and the enemies are level nine. And it's like, what? Uh, now there are some story missions and story plot points here and there. So switching characters between levels in the home base is good because you can interact with people and get different scenarios and see different scenes that you wouldn't normally see with just the same character every time. But it's like, you kind of want to pick a character and stay with them and then maybe do multiple playthroughs on New Game Plus to gain even higher levels or uh, play the arcade game upstairs that has a copy of, uh, was it Spy Hunter, I think? <laughs> uh, little Easter eggs and things like that in the game. Uh, it, it is pretty solid. I, I really enjoyed my time with it, but it does feel like it was a bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, it feels like something that was in development 10 years ago and just came out now. If it had come out at the same time or around the same time as Spider-Man, I think a lot of... The people online that have been having some criticism would have been like, oh, no, you know, they wouldn't have even thought twice about it. It's just it, I, because of the pandemic, everything got pushed a little bit. But it is a solid game. Don't be fooled. Don't let people tell you it's not good. I had a really good time with it. Uh, I know Birdman got himself a copy for his birthday, and he's going to dive in and have, uh, you know, a blast. And we're probably going to play some multiplayer at some point together with it. Uh, he's playing... Um, I think it's Batgirl. I played as Red Hood pretty much the entire time, and I had a really, really good time. Uh, it's worth checking out, I think, for somebody who is a big Batman fan or somebody who uh, might be on the fence because they, they saw some you know negative hype online. 
give it a chance. Uh, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised in that it's a really solid game uh, that has some quirks, but overall a really good time. The Prime Minister of Sweden visited Washington today, and my tiny little nipples went to France. Gossip, rumors, panic in the streets. We're lucky. This Week in Geek News. All right, guys, welcome back to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman. He's Alex, the producer. Well, it is time to break down a couple of the things that happened on this plane of existence. This is the Nerd News Network. And, well, this is the big gigantic tech-shaped elephant in the room that we all kind of saw this coming. It's just how it happened. We didn't see this coming. So according to Kotaku, confirmed by multiple outlets over this week, G4 Tech TV is being shut down only a year after its relaunch. A month after suffering a number of key layoffs and departures, the ill-fated attempt to reboot the 2000s gaming channel G4 TV is over, with its owners announcing they'll be shutting the network down. As Deadline reports, an email was sent to remaining staff today by David Scott, the CEO of the parent uh, company Spectator, a division of Comcast. In this memo, Scott explained, quote, uh, the company's investment and efforts to revive the network just didn't gain traction, end quote. Deadline also says a, uh, quote, few dozen employees and contract workers are affected by the shutdown. That's all that was left at the network after a round of, quote, major layoffs took place last month. The timing and severity of the cuts took staff by surprise with talent showing up on set today, ready to film, only to have programming canceled by HR reps met individually with employees. While it is not clear what the extent of the layoffs will be, one source said those affected will be able to receive between 16 weeks and six months of severance based upon their tenure with Comcast's G4 uh, parent company. Despite assurances in a subsequent broadcast that there are no plans to scale back the channel's programming, X-Play host Indiana F- Froskern, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Fro- Froskoon. Froskoon and Attack of the Show co-host Kevin Pereira also left shortly afterwards. This has been, quote, in, in motion for a long while, Pereira said of his departure. I know there's been some wacky events in, in the ether as of late, but months and months back this time, uh, was decided the show is going dark for two weeks and coming back. I won't be there. Sorry. And then I'm going to read the memo that was uh, obtained by Deadline. Team, as you know, G4 was reintroduced last year to tap into the popularity of gaming. We invested to create the new G4 as an online and TV destination for fans to be entertained, be inspired, and connect with gaming content. Over the past several months, we have worked hard to generate that interest in G4, but viewership is low and the network has not achieved sustainable financial financial results. This is certainly not what what we had hoped for and as a result we have made the very difficult decision to discontinue G4's operations effective immediately. I know this is disappointing news and I'm disappointed too. I want to thank you and everyone on the G4 team for the hard work and commitment to the network. Our human resources team is reaching out to you to provide to provide you with support, discuss other opportunities that may be available, and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you again for all your hard work for G4. Sincerely, Dave Scott, Chairman and CEO, Comcast Spectator. Um, uh, evidently, this was an update that was posted uh, not too long after the story. The Washington Post's Nathan Grayson says the termination was made so sudden that former G4 employees who had requested anonymity due to the signing of non-disclosure agreements told the post that staff were locked out of internal communication service services like Slack and Google drive without immediate explanation. Um, one person who found there, there were two very notable people who found out they were quote fired or let go from their job on Twitter. One of them was Gerard, the completionist, because he saw the tweet from, I think the Twitter account, it's at Wario64, so it's a fairly popular. Which is, not, it's one of the people that tends to have scoops and uh, stuff. some scoops, but not necessarily like really early scoops, but you know, generally right before, right as they're happening. And then the other piece of uh, on-air talent that found out they no longer have a job was WWE wrestler Xavier Woods. So the fact that you lose yeah. two of the biggest talents on your they find out via Twitter that couldn't have been a phone call that couldn't have been at least a nicely worded email. It's, it's <sighs> surprising. Gerard is surprising. I feel worst for as far as the newer people. 
Mm-hmm. I feel the worst for him. Yeah, because Mostly I think he was one of the he, best talent. He was put. He was putting in some of the the best effort. Uh, I I will talk briefly about my issues with G four, and they're not going to be the same ones that you see people regurgitating the same things online. And a lot of it is is almost the same like, talking it, points. Same talking points, or even like closed minded, bigoted. Like it's like no, 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 no. Here, the issues I see with it as so, from somebody who has a bit of a bit more perspective i think on how a lot of these businesses are run and you do too from uh from the perspective of how you know how a a media room is run and Mm -hmm. you know how how radio and how talent works uh from the business side of things the biggest problem i found with it was they were not organized the day they launched for uh for example for the first six months of of their production they didn't have playlists for individual episodes of the show on their YouTube channel. And that's something that could honestly be taken care of by someone An marking intern. down time codes. Yeah. You just need someone to mark down time codes when the file is there. It's literally going, okay, guys, we are on air for two hours today. I want you to cut between 58 minutes and well, they something. Would cut, they and would create cut things, something. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't title them properly. No, like you know, okay. Let's say they they would have a thing like they would say things like in the first month it was, uh, it, it would be like Monday, uh, October the whatever, and it will be like uh, day stream, and it would be six hour video with no chapters. And you're like, okay, well, what programming was in there? Like, and it'd be like, oh, there was two different shows in there. Okay, well, what were they? So unless you watched it live, the whole thing, you'd have no idea or you'd have to skip through. People were cutting them up and making their own channels to like post the videos because mm-hmm. people were getting pissed that they couldn't find it. And then when they started doing things like Attack of the Show, which was, you know, originally used to be multiple days a week and it was easy to find. It was like an hour. I think it was about an hour show. Maybe it was two hours. It's been a long time. But they were like three hours. Like they stretched the content so thin nobody has the attack like they were thinking oh people watch Twitch streamers for eight hours a, a day sometimes okay but you're on traditional television because you gotta remember they were on uh twitch uh on youtube and on a linear channel on like some cable network that was owned by by uh comcast. comcast right so they were on actual regular tv so they had to take breaks right where they'd go to commercial and it was kind of fun seeing you know they'd keep rolling while they were at commercial because they could do that for the live streams but people don't sit for that kind of TV show for three hours straight. Not anymore. They, no, but they never did. Nobody sat for three hours for a variety joke show. No, nope, Yeah. Like, like, I mean, even back in the day when I used to watch Attack of the Show live, I guess. It was, it was what, about an hour for the most yeah, part? Yeah, maybe an hour and a half. I mean, I don't remember a whole it, lot about it. It, it, it was... At no more than two hours with commercials even on mm-hmm. special occasions and it was what two or three days a week i think it was mm-hmm. something like that and yeah it, it was, and it was like the, monday wednesday friday i think something like that and, and again it might be different scheduling in canada than it was in the states it's just how mm-hmm. it is right but it was this was odd then they switched it to there's three different types of attack of the show shows one of them was like just like a podcast but they still branded it as attack of the show you can't have three shows with the same name like you know what i mean and they have like different versions of the justice league like you have to say yeah justice league Um, west or justice society or whatever and x play x play at this point would have worked as a segment on another program or like X Play didn't have to be an hour long or two hours long. Every show was too long, and they would they would be trying to fill it. People don't want talking heads for that long unless they're very well informed. Uh, and a lot of the hosts, and I won't name individual names, didn't come across as if they had an informed opinion. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but it doesn't make compelling television if it's an uninformed opinion. I think for me, I just I wasn't engaged by any of the hosts outside of Sessler and uh, Gerard. And S- Sessler, there, and he, I feel like in Canada for the most part, nobody gave a shit that like people like okay they like Sessler. In the states, I didn't realize how polarizing he was becoming because there are people that like 
he alienated a lot of the audience. He's very outspoken, very, very outspoken, very liberal. And I'm like, okay, like up here, that's, that's like the norm or in certain areas. But apparently he was pissing off their audience a lot, like online. And he feeds the trolls and not feeds the trolls like he was getting mad at them, but like he would goad them and stuff. He was behaving online like you would have 15 years ago. Mm hmm. And it's and they're like, oh, he's an old man. That's why he's yeah, okay. But still, like he he doesn't need to engage. What he should have done is had a separate account that is only used like for business, and then one that's his personal, uh, if you wanted to. But or regardless, his personal opinion shouldn't matter. But it became sort of an issue where people were getting mad at the show for even having him on because he's he's one of them snowflake. You know, it's like like it's it's ridiculous in the states how how polarizing and how divided the audiences are and it's like okay they i don't know if they knew their demographic as well as they thought they did you know for in that aspect uh and with frost you know everybody points the finger directly at them saying you're the reason this this entire program tanked and it wasn't the whole reason it was a major catalyst the the uh the big rant that was done of uh uh, sexism and gaming you, you could look it up all online mm -hmm. it, whether it was approved or not it's one thing the issue was the closing lines were if you don't like what i'm saying don't watch and yeah that's if you look at their, at if you it's not just that you can actually look at the social blade uh and other tracking sites the next day they lost 50 percent of their audience and they never came back I've never seen something tank that bad. And it was, it, you can actually put a direct correlation. What was being said was not necessarily wrong. It was how it was said, uh, why it was said uh, at, at that exact moment, and the platform it was said on. It was also a factor of, you could have just ignored the comments. Why do you have to read, why do you have to care what the comments are on your YouTube channel? You don't have to care. You chose to care. You chose to, to make this stand, and that's fine. I respect you, you if, for the stand you're making. I respect that you, you, you have a valid opinion. You have a valid thing. You just didn't go about it the right way, and I also don't believe it was done necessarily even for, the, for as altruistic reasons as initially thought. I That's think it maybe I think it maybe should have been if if Frost Coon wanted to do that statement, which again I'm totally fine with. Yeah. But if you but if you had invited other industry guests and turned that discussion into a full you, episode of something, that would have been better. Well, when they when they were they are speaking in definitive declarative statements, as in I am speaking for everyone, and I'm and they made comments about other hosts, the previous hosts uh, making declarative statements about them uh, that one, they wouldn't necessarily know unless they specifically talked to them. And two, in the past, these people have openly said, no, that's kind of part of why I was hired. You were, they were hired for a look for this, for an attitude, for, for fitting a certain way, fitting the culture, fitting what they needed. And they didn't need Frost Coon to be the voice for them on an opinion that is entirely their own and not, necessarily representative of them and it made frost couldn't look look foolish and the problem was if you said anything rebutting that you were viewed as you know bigoted and you're 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 feeding the whole issue and it's like no 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 if you if you take a step back it's like you have valid points you you don't have to adhere to that specific issues right but you can't make declarative statements about the past about what was clearly the entire basis of the show it was basically uh g4 and specifically like uh those programs like x play and attack of the show were geared specifically to the ages 13 to 25 year old male it was spike tv for the younger generation yeah, and it, 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 it was it was tongue-in-cheek and people were like oh it was, it was misogynist it was this, this it, it was sexist it was and it wasn't it was, you have to see the context of it being a lot of it was tongue in cheek. Uh, almost all the women hosts were clearly in on the jokes, part of the writing team, uh, completely being happy with it. And if they were upset with a specific thing, they might've come out later on and talked about it, but you've got to realize you can't look at something in a crystal ball and be like, Oh, it was terrible when everybody at the time thought it was fine, including the hosts. 
Like, and if and if you if you think that that you know, you know, you wouldn't fit in that situation, you probably wouldn't. You probably wouldn't have been hired for that position because you didn't fit the criteria of what they were going for at the time. And I feel like Frost can use the rant as a cover to deflect any criticism that was coming from some of the more outspoken shall we say no it, it, if you if you were to ever go back and watch a lot of the comments a lot of the even the reviews that frostkin was had been making they weren't very well informed like they well she's of, a league of she's a esports commentator that's more which, her, her, her thing exactly so re- reviewing certain things like it came across a lot like very narrow-minded and also almost sometimes where I, I I can't say for sure, but I want to question, did you really play the game that you're reviewing? Because like there were things that were sometimes said that were like, uh, like objectively not true or made to fit a narrative that they wanted. Like it just, it came across uh, Froskin and some of the other younger, I don't want to just focus on Froskin, but just because that's in the news, a lot of the younger hosts that, that we're talking, the hosts that are under 30 or under 35, a lot of them appeared like they're not ready to be on TV. The thing I had a problem with um, was when G4 and Spike TV were in their heyday, you were looking at a very specific slice of North American culture seen through a very specific lens. It, it was and, it was the it was millennial teen culture. Yeah, and unfortunately, you're never going to recapture the magic of re of hearing the Tony Hawk pro skater three soundtrack for the first time. You're never going to recapture seeing your first Lincoln park yeah. concert. You, like like you're, you're, you're just never going to get that vibe and, again. And it didn't have to be that. And in fact, uh, in some aspects at the beginning, the production values were pretty good. Some of the hosts were good. You can still be edgy in quotes and make fun jokes and do things. If everybody's in on the joke and they're all having a good time, but there was a culture clash, not just old and young, some of the the hosts did not mesh well. There was not a lot of good chemistry between people. And that might come from the fact that a lot of these people were YouTubers or Twitch streamers where they were in control of their whole narrative their entire life. They've, they, they're, they had not really had TV exposure outside of either esports gaming commentary uh, or doing their own streams. They had never really been a part of an actual television production. And this was presented as a television production. Gerard did his best. Uh, he seemed to get more comfortable as he went on. Uh, Will Neff, who had been on a bunch of, was it BuzzFeed, I think he was doing? He was genuinely really funny. And he he was the best new co-host, probably, in my mind, of Attack of the Show. Uh, same with Gina Darling was, was pretty good on there. Uh, and they fit the same wit and humor. The other hosts, a lot of them, what? looking young is one thing and you can change certain looks and they didn't they looked like rogers access tv trying to compete with like the cbc you know what i mean it looked like college kids trying to make a local access tv show and then they happened to have a few hosts that were real professional with them like the teachers were like doing the program with them to show them and you could see uh uh Pereira trying to like wrangle everybody and and um xavier woods was pretty good because uh, obviously he, like, as far as television experience, there was nobody on the program that had more than him yeah. at all. Like, he, even though Sessler's been on TV for 25 years, he was not he's for not, that long. He, he's, yeah. he's not yeah. on five hours of, of live television in front of 20,000 people every week for the last 12 years. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so, so obviously he was the most comfortable in his own skin, but some other people just didn't quite fit. They didn't quite mesh. And they had too many hosts. They were revolving through people. Some of them should have stayed as commentators or doing like they were not ready for prime time. If that makes any sense, there and was they tried some, and some of them tried to cover that up by placing blame on their audience. If you complain about me, it's because you're bigoted, not because I'm inadequate at my job. Well, I'll say this about the whole situation, which kind of encompasses your argument. You produced no content that I cared enough to seek out. There was nothing compelling. I, Sessler, sure, having him back was cool, but that's not enough to drive me to no. Twitch at, at a certain time. No, you know what? Let's watch it on YouTube. But what would have worked is 
X play should have been a weekly segment, not every day or whatever, whatever they were having it. They should both attack of the, you could have done attack of the show and, uh, and X play as a, a two hour block, a two hour video that is on, you know, a regular TV network. They could have just produced those two shows and not spent all the money on all the stupid extra things they were doing. Nobody cared about the, the talk shows. Nobody cared about, the, the other stuff they only cared about those two retro shows nothing else mattered Truly. honestly what they should have done in my opinion is offer them to a premium streaming service like for example hulu which is tied into disney you know what? hbo or something like that and say or comcast, amazon comcast who owns comcast um nbc universal maybe peacock it wouldn't have worked on there it what it would have worked is they should have offered uh, both programs to Amazon and they could have had it where it's on like promoted on Twitch or have hell even Netflix. Hey, like, you know, we, we need to have, or you know what attack of the show would have worked even though it's not from the same parent company. You could have had that on HBO, you know, back to back on Sunday nights or Friday nights or something with, with uh, 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 Bill Maher or with, with, uh, John Oliver. Uh, John Oliver. Uh, and X Play would have worked if you had it on a regular program or or you had it as part of a larger program somewhere else. They just didn't have enough content that was worthwhile watching to maintain a, a daily show every day of the week. Uh, and again, I feel bad for some of the people there. I feel bad for everybody. If they worked hard, it sucks. But you know what? It sounds bad to say this. Not everybody deserves to be on TV forever. And you had your chance. If you couldn't connect with the fans, you couldn't connect with people. So you just might not be at that level. It might not ever happen for you, but you don't just get to blame everybody else when you're not good at your job. I mean, honestly, one of the things I learned through broadcasting school when I went a number of years ago is just some people have on-air charisma. Yes. Some people have radio charisma. Some, and there's always the old joke. Oh, you've got a face for radio. Well, and like, some people, some people have that excitement, and they're actually better in an audio environment than they are just in a video environment. Yeah, I, I mean, like I'm a great example of that. If you put me in front of a camera, I will hate my life. You put me, <laughs> you put me in this environment, I'm completely comfortable. Well, then, I'm you, relaxed, and I'm. You controlled. know what we need to do? We need to, if we ever decide to go f- like full video and start doing video streaming and, and do or do video podcasts, we need to look into doing one of those face rig things where we have like <laughs> avatars that move their mouths when we talk so it, it, we're sort of there and we're sort of not there and that's fine or is it uh vtubers or whatever we could do yeah that. And see be, that I, wouldn't be so bad yeah do make it a wagoosh a wagoosh vtuber for you there and we go would, and then i would be some curmudgeonly old like angry person or something but again i feel bad like sessler he's gonna be fine he's like he uh, people are getting mad at him he doesn't care he made his <laughs> he, money he doesn't give a shit he, he doesn't care he, he has whatever integrity whatever if you like him you don't like him he is who he is he's like 50 big deal he's in his 50s who cares uh i feel bad for Pereira because he clearly really tried to get it all together i knew that there was danger signs just to finish off this little news story i knew there were danger signs when two things happened uh, i was actually pretty excited for them to come back even if it was going to be like specials or if it was going to be it didn't have to be a regular youtube thing where it's like every week even if it was a monthly show i would have been happy with it if it was on on there it's when they did their reunion special mm-hmm. and and that was actually really super well received i think it was like thanksgiving or something yeah they something like that. that uh and they brought back a lot of the old hosts and not not that they were all going to be there but afterwards when that was really successful and and the chemistry was still there they still did it it had the exact same feel the same look everything it looked fantastic it, and you could see that they even though they had been apart for years they they all seemed to gel um and after that they announced hey morgan webb's going to come back to do certain specials here and there and then morgan webb disappeared right away and i'm like oh was there a contract negotiation problem that didn't go through okay and olivia munn had signed on and then i think she i think she was having a baby or something so they used that as an excuse as to why she didn't come back and she was removed from their talent roster almost immediately she was supposed to come back and do special shows i think she saw the scripts and saw how rinky dinky it was going to be and was like nah not going to do this 
And when that happened, I was like, oh, that sucks. And the first week they launched, and like I said, they still for months had problems with with how they how you could even navigate to find their cool stuff and find their clips. But when it launched, I looked and I'm like, oh, they changed the theme songs. I'm like, that's not good. People want people, if you're gonna do a nostalgia show, do a nostalgia show. You own the theme song. Why are you using something new? And uh then the final thing was I, I looked and I was like, oh, I know it's an HD and, and, and HD cameras are different than when they used to use the broadcast cameras, yada, yada, yada. It looked cheaper. And I'm like, no, why does it look cheaper than the special they filmed? The special should have been cheap because that was like the pilot and it just looked like crap, unfortunately. So that's, that's my final thoughts. I mean, I feel bad for everybody involved. I think that some people are getting mad at the wrong issues here. Uh, I hope everybody falls on their, you know, flatly on their feet. They can do yeah. well. Um, I, I feel bad for some of the old hosts. I feel bad for some of the new hosts. I do think, I think X play is done and doesn't need to exist. Um, because they can do it. So many other people that yeah, do that kind like, of content anyway. And if Sessler and those people, if they want to do their own thing together, if they want to do a collective, they can do it. I do think the, the show that had the most chance of, of doing well was attack of the show because there were other shows that were similar and some of them went on YouTube and a lot of the YouTube ones that were like that copied what attack of the show was. So attack of the show still in my mind has, it's almost like, I think that could still carry on. They could retool it because, mm-hmm. you know, like the American Ninja warrior and all this, like there are shows that are still on TV that use that. And I still think that you could sell that to like comedy central. Yeah. I mean, ultimately I, I, hope everybody who was affected by this shutdown finds their way. And if people want to leave the industry because it leaves a bad taste in their mouth. I mean, there's been several other stories that have broke this yeah. week, which we're not talking about. No, just, um, just remember that everything stuff. you do, everything you do and say online will come back to bite you. So be mature. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many times that you feel bad and want to apologize later on. Once you said something mean or hurtful or or bad, perception is everything. It's there forever. So if you're going to post something that you think is snarky or funny or mean, maybe take a moment and think before you do it because it will affect your careers. And, and we're seeing that happen with some of these people. Exactly. All right. So our last news story, we didn't expect that to take up a half hour, but hey, well, it's a big thing you, we could you not said, talk about. You said big story. We, we're getting it all out now so we never have to talk about it again unless somebody – something crazy happens we're done with that (laughs) exactly we are done so moving on to something a little bit different didn't quite uh see this coming this reporting comes courtesy of kotaku cyberpunk 2077's dlc will have a radio station hosted by sasha gray you might have heard sasha gray's voice in other games like volition's saints row the third so listen up it's not it's not it's not her voice i know her for (laughs) oh boy Oh Listen, boy! If you if you recognize that name, you, you, there's a reason you recognize that name. But she's actually a pretty good actress, legit. Mm-hmm. So listen up, Chooms. Cyberpunk 2077's Night City is going to get a new radio station when the game's Phantom Liberty expansion drops next year. One that will be hosted, or one that will be led by former porn star and Saint Row third voice actress Sasha Gray. CD Projekt Red announced on Twitter that 89.7 Grow or Growl. FM will be a new community radio station available in Phantom Liberty. While we don't have any idea what the station will sound like in terms of music, we at least know who the DJ is and their voice actress. Their name is Ash, and Gray will bring them to life. The announcement is short, giving us a sweet taste of Gray's acting chops as a radio station DJ. She doesn't say much of anything and we don't get to see ash's character model but apparently there's a whole lot cooking quote in night city now you might be familiar with gray's work if you didn't catch her porn career between 2007 and 2011 you might have seen her in films like the 2012 psychological horror thriller would you rather 2014 sci-fi thriller the scribbler uh 
and gamers will likely recognize Gray from Saints Row the Third and its Gat Out of Hell expansion, where she voiced Viola De Winter, uh, Kiki's twin and lieutenant of the Morningstar gang. Gray is also a popular content creator with more than one million followers on Twitch and nearly four hundred and thirty thousand subscribers on YouTube. Kotaku reached out to CD Projekt Red and Gray for comments. Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven has seen a massive resurgence thanks to Studio Trigger's superb anime adaptation edge runners which i still haven't watched and the copious bug fixes and stability adjustments that bring the game to a smoother and more playable state as such cd project red's action rpg has shot up the charts becoming a steam bestseller and seeing millions of players flock to night city's neon streets to take revenge on one cybernetic mercenary dickhead known as adam smasher i just gotta add it in that last little part there <laughs> they didn't say dickhead in the, in the press release <laughs> no they they did not call adam smasher a dickhead but yeah i mean i think this well, is cool well aren't you a cut of fuckable meat <laughs> thanks god, god he's terrifying well i hear that all i can think of is the stupid borat video you showed me <laughs> where he's like well, aren't you a cut of fuckable meat very nice how much <laughs> what kind of dog is this yeah guys okay so go out and look on youtube type in borat in cyberpunk it'll be the best minute and a half you will ever spend yeah somebody had a really fun time putting in superimposing him into scenes and there's other videos it, it brings you down a uh you know right down into the, the trail of like what was it uh robocop and austin uh, powers uh, austin powers and ace ventura ace ventura and mr bean <laughs> i mean there are some really 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 talented artists out there to make this kind of stuff come to life uh to talk about the story for a minute um one of the things that attracts me to these huge open world games like your grand theft autos and your saints rose is the music and the djs i mean i remember when the first time I played Grand Theft Auto 3, Vi or, yeah, Grand Theft Auto Vice City, other than the 80s music playing, it was the DJs like um, Fernando from Love uh, FM. There's the really outlandish guy in Grand Theft Auto 5 who's really, really, really funny, um, Laszlo. Like there are some really great personalities and they can really fill out the world of the game. I know for one of cyberpunk stations, uh, the game's creator, Mike Pondsmith is a DJ in the game. If I'm recalling that fact correctly, that, that I didn't know. Yeah. Like there's a lot of really neat stuff for games like this, and it can really add a new layer of immersion into it. And if that station plays the right thing, it can really do wonders. I mean, one of my biggest complaints about cyberpunk is I've never found a station that felt like my play style. I, I usually went with the ambient electronica station, but I don't remember anything else other than when samurai yeah. plays chipping in. A lot of it is very similar and it's really good, but a lot of it is, it's not as diverse. Yeah. Like it's very hard to live up to, a oh, grand there, theft auto there was that one like chinese inspired sounding song i remember that playing a bunch yeah but i, I mean if you had to ask me like what they're called i don't remember any of the titles yeah i mean even with the saints row stuff arguably their best soundtracks were saints row 4 and saints row 3 but i think 4 has a much better story and soundtrack i mean if anything just for stan bush's the fucking touch to play during it but it's like the right piece of content can make a world feel different and if gray is with you while you're driving across the night city uh outskirts of town whether you're helping out the night city police department or if you're hunt hunting down cyber psychos it can really add something to the game and like the story mentions there's been so many improvements made to the game there was a recent piece of content added where there's like new missions for your fixers you can get new weapons you can actually do trans mods now where you don't have to look goofy because this piece of armor has a really good rating but it looks stupid you can choose what it looks like i haven't played with it yet i'm looking forward to going back in when we take our break the last I did was when I got the review copy for PS5 and uh, I was able to do a full playthrough without it crashing once. And I was like, hallelujah. 
Because so, if you, you you remember my journey of five thousand friggin' crashes w- when it first launched, um, so it's it's amazing how much they've made it improve. I didn't, I honestly didn't think they could get it into the state that it's currently in. Yeah, like honestly, it's the game that needed to be on the shelf for another year for it to get ready for prime time. Like they obviously launched way too early, but the fact that there is DLC confirmed coming out fairly soon, my guess is we'll either see it at the end of this quarter. So at the, at the end of February or maybe for the summer, that's my guess. Um, Probably around the quote unquote E3, something will happen. And then whether Cyberpunk's 2077 gets any more DLC at this point is anybody's guess. They are talking about a sequel already. So we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Uh, So other than that, guys, that's going to do it for this edition of the Nerd News Network, only on thisworkinggeek.net. But we're going to take things off on the USS Protostar and go into place where no one has gone before this is the final frontier this is the video game adaptation of star trek prodigy brought to you by alex we'll be back guys right after this only on this week in geek.net it's been the better part of a decade since we've had a major star trek console gaming release and our friends at outright games sent a review copy of Star Trek Prodigy Supernova for us to check out. Uh, now, my code was a PS4 code, but that automatically uh, carried forward and gave me a uh, dual purchase of the PS4 version and the PS5 version. And I can say that the PS5 version cut the install size down uh, a fair amount. Uh, the game itself, is <laughs> it's small enough you could load it directly into RAM, uh, so the, the load times are, are nigh non-existent. And that is not anything to say, like, the graphics aren't good. The graphics are great. It's just that it's basically transposed the same fidelity that you get from the actual cartoon show. And it's obviously a CGI, uh, hyper-stylized, but CGI design that lends itself to, you know, great compression, especially on the PS5. Uh, where they don't have to have multiple assets copied over uh, a regular hard drive. It's all on the SSD, so it loads super quick. Uh, and to that end, it's very well optimized. Uh, I found maybe I'll, I'll get some of the negatives out ahead of time because I'm going to go a little more in depth into my overall thoughts of the good parts of the game. So negative wise, uh, there's a couple bugs here and there. Nothing that broke the game that forced me to, uh, close the game and reboot. Uh, there was a couple points where I was worried that I was going to have to, uh, have to reset, but that's because I, I thought I got stuck in geometry, um, where it wasn't really that I was stuck. It was sort of stuck, but you could switch to a different character and then sort of unstick yourself. I thought there was a part where it glitched and wasn't loading uh, bad guys in an instance area. Basically when you go to different areas, uh, on the map. It'll start a battle sequence and that closes off the area so that you can't leave the area till you've beat the enemies and the enemies will spawn in and walk in from beyond the barrier. Well, I got to a point where they just weren't coming in through the barrier. They were sitting behind the barrier like they had spawned in the wrong spot and switching to another character and running around a little bit, they somehow dislodged themselves and came in. I don't know what was triggering it, what was wrong or something. But it's the little little things like that that you'll find in these more budget titles. But it's not as budget as I thought it was going to be. Yes, it's not uh, a full, you know, $90 Canadian game. It's, it's less money. It's actually more in line with what I would hope for a lot of licensed properties. But it, it does have a lot of heart put into it. You can see that the team that worked on this clearly had inspiration and had input from the team at paramount that makes the show uh now for those that don't know uh this is based on the new tv show that i thought initially had finished its first season but it was doing that sort of thing where they split the season in two parts and it took a hiatus as of uh this recording they're getting ready to ramp up their second half of the the season i'm not sure if this is directly going to tie into the story of the game but you don't have to have seen the show to play the game, 
but you get a significant more out of it if you have watched the show because this digs very deep into the lore of the show and reveals things that I'm not sure if they're going to reveal it in the show or if they're going to sort of expect you to play the game. Uh, I'm actually okay with that because, again, it's not an overly expensive game. You know, you're not breaking the bank to play it. And it feels like you are playing almost like a mid-season miniseries uh, focusing or like a mini-movie focusing on the characters of the show. So what happens is, beginning of the game, you find this Dyson Sphere and you get sucked in to the this, this solar system, crash on a planet, and you're slowly uncovering what's going on and there's like a doomsday thing happening. Uh, and I won't spoil anything else beyond that, but you get to find out backstories of a couple of the characters, antagonists and protagonists, as you play throughout and you uh, build up your team and it, it, it everything is sort of on the trajectory that the show was on where they're slowly becoming a family as you play. And the game is narrated by Janeway and... Uh, Janeway acts as sort of the central hub. After each level, you go back to to the Protostar, and you can walk around the base of the Protostar, see the things that you've unlocked from finding collectibles, uh, as well as upgrade skills and health and, and weapons, um, and do challenge missions and uh, some arena battle type things. It, it's pretty neat that way. This game is surprisingly one of the few I've seen in recent years that is built around couch co-op. So you can play it completely solo like I did, or where it's sort of intended to be is you play it with a per person sitting at the couch, so either your kid, your friend, your dad, your mom, your your brother, your sister, uh, your friend, a uh, person off the street that you gave a little cash to, I need a second player, whatever you want to do. And uh, what you'll end up doing is you both control a character, you go into battle, every... Each one has a strength and a weakness where one person has uh, better phasers, uh, distance attacks, and one person is stronger physically. But it is almost like an Ubisoft or uh, PS1 slash PS2 level uh, puzzle platformer. It's like you're not jumping around because you can dash across things, but you don't jump. But it's a corridor sort of mazy overworld for each level. And you can find hidden things off the beaten path if you look around. But you go from corridor to corridor, solving puzzles and having action parts where you're beating up enemies. The enemies uh, are repetitive in that they look very similar because they're all based on the same sort of robotic enemy. But they slowly, over the course of the entire game, introduce you to brand new uh, enemy patterns. Uh, some are like use homing missiles. Some will dash at you. Some have shields, some heal other people, and you sort of shake it up by uh, figuring out as you go very slowly, but not like methodically, but not boringly, if that makes any sense. You learn new moves and new tactics, and by the end, you're jumping around, flipping, doing crazy stuff, and it's pretty fun. It has a pretty good pace that way, uh, and the majority of the game is those fighting sections, a little bit of exploration in each level. Uh, where you can come back to it once you've rescued other crew members that can open up secret areas for you to unlock more things and unlocking more things gives you more perks and bonuses uh, and fills up your trophy room which, with stuff that once you've received the trophy uh, items, you go interact with them on the Protostar and Janeway will give history and they're all uh, items that are either tied to Voyager uh, with history specifically for specific episodes, little funny nods, or to classic things from the original series and from the TNG era. Now, uh, the big part of this game you're going to spend a lot of time in is the puzzles. And it's physics-based puzzles, so things like moving around blocks to then transport them to another area, to then move them into a spot that creates a path for you to go over, or that uh, uses light to... Like this one thing will emit a light beam and you have to move it into place so that it reflects off something else to open a door. Uh, and it's, it's mostly intuitive in that I didn't really ever get lost. Only one time I had to backtrack and I got stuck for like 10, 15 minutes. But it's enough that I could see some kids having trouble getting through it on their own. They'd have to really be methodical. Some of those ones that are a little more difficult, they might need a parent to play with them or somebody older 
or you might need to get a guide online, or you can take your time and you'll figure it out. It, it's very difficult to get put into a position where you're stuck. I, I never encountered a, a spot where I accidentally got stuck and couldn't complete without re retrying. Um, so there is basically one path that you can do to get yourself through to the next area, and usually a secondary path that you could do before that, which will then like take you to a secret area to get one of the unlockables or to get some extra crystals that are used to upgrade things. So think PS1 slash PS2 era platformer mixed with like an Ubisoft title from that era, you know, pre Assassin's Creed, that, that THQ era, the, the acclaim era, that sort of stuff. But with, uh, the sheen of a 1080p slash 4k game that looks exactly like a cartoon show that's on TV. Uh, the game is completely voice acted by the crew, uh, and the same people that do the, the TV show. Uh, there are some parts that the cutscenes are done as like a motion comic. So there's some corners that were either cut or budgetary constraints that keep it from bringing it to that level of like a real high end game, if that makes sense. It's still super duper fun, but it, it's missing some of the bells and whistles that take it into the higher echelon, uh, which at first glance you might go, Oh, does that make it a cash grab? It's not because it's pretty integral to the actual plot and mythos of, of the, the show itself. And I had a really good time playing it. Uh, there's three worlds uh, and ranging anywhere from four to five levels on each world that you can repeat a second or third time to do speed runs or to unlock extra areas once you have extra characters and find all the collectibles. Find uh, getting There's three trophies you can get at the end of each uh, level. One is for collecting a certain amount of items. One is for uh, not dying a certain amount of times. And one is for uh, beating at a certain speed beating it at a certain speed in every single level of the game will unlock uh, a in basically an invincibility mode. And so once you get that, you could use that to, you know, go through certain areas and complete things you couldn't do before if you really could. Then there's the one uh, that is for not dying a bunch of times. I believe that's the one that gives you big head mode. So it reminds me of like a, a N64 Dreamcast PS1 era where they had those sort of cheat codes you can unlock it it doesn't do anything but make your head bigger in, in battle and the last uh one that you get for getting all of those trophies or all those those badges is uh it gives you the ability to do double the damage with your weapons in each level and you have to turn them on manually every time you load a level so you don't accidentally have it on and that can help you do some of the challenges that are just maybe a little too difficult for you to do there are difficulty settings for the game but some of the stuff is more challenging when you're doing the uh, the holodeck challenge mode stuff. And um, there's there's plenty of stuff here. It's it's sort of got the right amount of stuff to keep you interested, but you it doesn't feel like it's overly long. It will be something that takes you 10 to 15 hours, I would say. I mean, I, I wasn't actually tracking how much time I spent, but it was roughly 20 to 30 minutes per ep like per level. Maybe a little longer than the couple ones that got stuck, so I have to eh, fifteen to twenty hours, maybe. If you're maybe a little more, if you want to do absolutely everything, so you're getting a, a pretty good value out of it. It, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Uh, if this is the quality of games that they're going to start putting out for these tie-in games for Star Trek, I'd be perfectly happy getting more and getting sequels to this. Uh, I think it's pretty good in that sense. Uh, it does, like I said at the beginning, have a little bit of uh, hiccups here and there with some of the uh, of the the uh, collision detection stuff that I think can get ironed out with a patch later on. It wasn't super intrusive, uh, giving me like any major issues or anything there. Uh, but it, it, it is worth noting that it's there. I also, in the uh, credit sequence at the very end of the game, noticed uh, a pretty glaring spelling error in one of the you know first things that pops up on the screen when you complete the game. I'm like, I didn't, I was trying to figure out how did somebody miss that? Because it's a complete misspelling. Uh, and I know that the game is developed in Europe, and uh, I believe it's in Europe, and it's not, English isn't the first language. It's either that or it's Brazil. <laughs> it's either South America or Europe. Sorry for not knowing, but I know that it's not their first language. So it's something that could have been caught or should have been caught in bug testing or in play testing. But it's just a minor thing. So it does, again, make me think of the era of like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when a lot of these games had little hiccups like that. And it, has, it adds a little bit of charm. But I really enjoyed myself with it. Uh, it's not a very expensive game. 
If you're a fan of Star Trek in general, you might want to check it out. If you are a fan of the TV show and you're watching it as a family or on your own, uh, it's pretty much on every platform. Uh, It's going to run smooth on anything you basically put it on because uh, it's pretty well optimized in its engine. And I think you'll have a pretty good time with it. Go crazy? Don't mind if I do! Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria! Welcome back to This Week in Geek.net. Thank you, Alex, for taking us beyond the final frontier. Uh, you can check that out. That game will likely be in our holiday gift guide, which will be premiering in December uh, before we take our big uh, month-long hiatus here on the show. But it is time to talk about the strange, the unusual, the dark secrets that humanity has held back for far too long. This is the weird news. And it's going to be a short version this week because, well, we got things to do this week. But trust me, we got two really good stories. One kind of, oh my God, and the other, huh, well, that's scary as shit. So let's start things off with a, huh, well, that's kind of odd. So according to WCVB5 uh, ABC, Boston's news leader, bees unleashed an attack on deputies during eviction enforcement, Hampton County Sheriff says. Uh, Rory Susan Woods, 55, of Hadley, faces charges including assault and battery. Uh, Deputies assigned to enforce an an eviction in a western Massachusetts uh, said they were attacked by a woman armed with swarms of bees. The deputies were enforcing an eviction notice at 49 Memory Lane in Long Meadow at 9.15 a.m. on October 12th when a blue Nissan Xterra pulled up uh, Hampton County Sheriff uh, Nicholas Cucci said in a statement, the SUV was driven by 55 year old Rory Susan Woods of Hadley. The sheriff said Woods was towing manufactured beehives behind her, uh, sorry, behind her SUV. Photos provided by the sheriff's office show Woods struggling with a deputy. A sheriff's deputy tried to stop her, but the agitated bees started getting out and circling the area, so he pulled back, the sheriff wrote in a statement. She then smashed the lid and flipped the hive off the flatbed, making the bees extremely aggressive. They swarmed the area and stung several officers and innocent bystanders who were nearby. Woods donned a beekeeper suit and carried a tower of bees to the front door of the home, where she further agitated the bees, Coochie said. The sheriff said this was an attempt to stop the eviction process. Photos provided by the sheriff's office show Woods was still wearing the beekeeper suit when she was eventually arrested. This woman who traveled here put lives in danger as several of the staff on scene were allergic to bees, Coochie said in a statement provided by his office. We had one staff member go to the hospital, and luckily he was all right, or she would be facing manslaughter charges. I I support people's right to protest peacefully, but when you cross the line and put my staff and the public in danger, I promise you will be arrested. Woods is facing four counts of assault and battery by means of a dangerous weapon, three counts of assault by means of a dangerous weapon, and one count of disorderly conduct. She was booked at the Western Massachusetts Regional Women's Correctional Facility. Zillow shows the home at 49 Memory Lane is a 9,563 square foot uh, with seven bedrooms, nine bathrooms, and the estimated value is $1.5 million. Quote, we are always prepared for protests when it comes to evictions, but a, but a majority of the groups who protest understand that we are just doing our statutory duty in accordance with state laws, said Cucci. And quote, they appreciate how we go above and beyond to help people being evicted, anything they need from food to temporary shelter to long-term housing, employment and mental health and substance use uh, disorder treatment. Now, this house, Alex, has a full-size basketball court in it. Oh, God. This is a McMansion, as another podcast had said when I looked up this story. Um, I don't feel bad because evidently they hadn't paid the mortgage on this place since I want to say at least 2017 or something. Oh, oh God. Okay. <laughs> Long eviction in this McMansion. How you could think you could do that with seven bedrooms, nine baths, a full basketball court. I mean, the only thing this thing was missing was probably like a 27 car garage curated by Jay Leno. Like this is ridiculous. And the fact that she used bees on one hand, it does sound kind of funny. But what if somebody went into anaphylactic shock from getting stung by a bee? Because that shit happens. Yeah, see, when I hear bees, I hear bees for whatever reason in my head. Uh, but 
<laughs> I, I, like we cover a lot of weird kind of legal stuff on this show. And I got to say, this is one of the stranger stories we've, we've ever covered. And the fact that she had enough forethought to wear a beekeeper suit, because evidently that's what she did in, in her spare time. She was like a beekeeper. So I'm like, all right. The only other strange story I can think of where it was assault was something really, really, really strange is where people were getting their, were, were getting property damaged by baked beans in England. If you remember that story from a couple of years ago. Yeah, you're right. I wonder if they ever caught that guy. Probably not. Um, I mean, the only other weird story before I get to, Alex's that I think is kind of worth kind of mentioning uh, to look up. If you've been following the news this past week, uh, British Prime Minister Liz Truss was kicked out of office less than six weeks into the job. Somebody had set up a joke webcam, uh, a joke live stream saying who will last longer, a head of lettuce or Liz Truss. And somehow the lettuce won. (laughs) <laughs> somebody yeah. posted this fact they're like liz truss is the only prime minister in british history not to have a doctor who episode featuring them so there's a little yeah. bit of random trivia for you yeah yeah <laughs> also t- terrible poli- okay it's a okay whatever you say about the politics they that party is the uh, right of center party not something over- like that yeah it's not like insanely right, but it's pretty far right, farther right than our, our a little farther right than our conservative parties are even here. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe a, a little closer to the American ones, but without maybe quite being as d- divisive. And her policies, from what I understand, the policies she put in, uh, was bringing in and her entire platform was so universally hated by not just the people, you know, in the streets angry, her own party thought it was too extreme and it was going to tank the country Yeah, that, that like, I think her finance minister left or she appointed a new one. It got to the point where they're like, they had, door. well, she had people in the party that had been elected members for years, actually not just walk out. They quit. They, they, they said, we're not, I'm not going to represent my constituents at all because of you. And like, they're not coming back. Like they're done with the party, maybe not done with politics. That's how much they hated her and her, her policies. And yet somehow, like, I want to know how it's like, it's like they threw a dart at a board and went, Oh, her name's there. So she, she's going to be our leader. We can't think of anybody else. Yeah. It and was, she, uh, she's going to be known for two things. She's going to be known for this debacle. And she's going to be known for the one, uh, for the, uh, the PM, that made the announcement about the about queen dying. Pork? Yeah. And she's going to, she, she made, she's going to be the one that spoke at the, basically spoke the eulogy and spoke to the, to the people. So they, you could say that it's a highlight of somebody's career to do that, but you know what? It's two lowlights. Her entire career is somber and sad. You know, what's funny though. I saw this pop up on Twitter. She was in the job just long enough to qualify for over a hundred thousand dollar a year pension, just long enough by like uh, a day or two. Yeah, ain't life fun. Some so moving, people are going. Some people are going to be very mad about that. I would be very upset as well. So moving on to the next story, Alex found this story because it's like, hey, Mike, you like weird, fucked up shit. And not Alex's usual brand of fucked up shit. So in honor of my sister, who loves all things nature, weird, deadly, and metal as fuck, uh, this one comes courtesy of Indie100.com. And uh, this is an older story, according to this. Uh, So this comes from July 26th of this year, but that's fine. There is a death pool that has been discovered at the bottom of the sea, which kills everything in it instantly. If you weren't scared of the ocean already, you probably will be after seeing this. A death pool has been discovered at the bottom of the Red Sea that instantly kills everything that swims in it. The pool was discovered by the University of Miami researchers and measures a whopping 107,000 or sorry, 107,000 feet. 
or uh, 100,000. I can't say this, Alex. Help me out here. Um, <laughs> big on, fucking hole. You're, you're on your that's, I'm on my hole. That's what, that's what she said? Indeed? I mean, I oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> so this. So, so, uh, so, when, so when it's a big. A big, a big fucking hole that kills anything that goes inside of it. Sounds like one of my exes. No, ha, 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 God, that's disturbing. But also, I'm terrified, Michael. Yeah, because it gets weirder when you read out why it's so deadly. So this thing, it's a long way down. It was discovered 1.1 miles beneath the surface of the uh, inlet of the Indian Ocean found between Africa and Asia. And it's been there for an awfully long time, too. The pools are thought to have been formed from pockets of minerals, which were deposited up to 23 million years ago. The reason why it's so deadly is... It contains no oxygen. Instead, it's filled with brine, and the salt solution is as deadly uh, to most things that enter it. Researcher Sam Perkis told Live Science, any animal that strays into the brine is immediately stunned or killed. He said that the pool is among the most extreme environments on Earth. It is used by some creatures for for food, with Perkis saying, Fish, shrimp, and eels appear to use the brine to hunt. Predators position themselves on the peripheries of the pool in order to feed on the unlucky creatures that die after swimming into it. While it's not the first brine-filled pool under the sea discovered by scientists in the Red Sea, it is the closest to land. It can be found just uh, 1.25 miles off the coast of Egypt, while the previous closest pool was more than 15 miles away from land. Um... I always wondered if stuff like this exists because I know the further down you go in the ocean as, as the pressures change, as chemical composition changes with the water down there, you can want, you can literally be in water, but in areas that have no oxygen. So if your skin were to touch that uh, bad news for you, uh, it's like the, in the Mariana's French, they have those, what is it? The sulfur and mercury and whatever those, what are they called? Those hydrothermal vents. Yeah. 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 Where they have like the weird, crazy, like prehistoric animals that like can live in it, but they can't even live outside of it. All but, that say, weird shit. but say, yeah, like places like this are where ex- extreme life forms could exist. I mean, to extrapolate this further into something a little bit more interesting and far-fetched, these are environments that may very well exist on exoplanets, like beneath like the surface of Europa or something like that, or uh, Io or Ganymede or any of these other uh, icy moons out by uh, Jupiter and I think Neptune. Like there are places in the solar system that may have these types of oceans, and it's not inconceivable for life to develop here, but it's going to be an such different from what we are used because we're a carbon based life form we don't know what's out there so it's very fascinating to see things like this in our own backyard it's not only that we don't it's just that the way our brains work and the way we understand science when you see in science fiction like oh it's a silicon based life form it's like okay from a from a scientific like sci-fi perspective you're like oh it's a foreign foreign type of being but you know what we actually can't really fathom what life that isn't carbon based could be based on because as far as our observable universe to us and who we are everything has to be carbon so for all we know there there are way different things that we can't even fathom in other parts of the universe or universe or whatever and the best way i can describe this like that death pool down there would be the equivalent of you walking into a building that's had an ammonia leak yeah and you don't know like like yes there's the smell right Actually, no, no. Ammonia, that's bad. It would be like, yeah, you you would smell it. And if you, it would be like you walking into a building that has a natural gas leak that doesn't have that chemical added to give it the rotten egg smell. Like, I know there are places. You you, you know that that's, you know that natural gas doesn't actually have a scent, right? And we add something to it. Uh, And I know that sometimes deaths happen when it's not been properly added into the mix Mm -hmm. because you, you actually don't even realize that the room's air is getting thinner and that it's got a toxic chemical till you're already dead. If you can smell that rotten egg smell, that sulfur smell, and you're like, oh, I smell natural gas, that is dangerous. That means it's, it's getting to the point where it's like, I got to get out of here. But 
the way it's designed is you'll smell that well before the actual gas hits you. So it would be the equivalent of that. Like you imagine like you, you go into a building, it, it doesn't has natural gas, but it doesn't have that smell. And it'd be like any animal that walks through there just collapses and dies. And you're like, why is it dying? I can't see why it's dying. <laughs> That's the equivalent. Only thing is being down in the ocean. How are we going to test it? Yeah. Like I remember finding out what's in those pools for example in uh yellowstone national park like to touch some of those pools they're not just superheated they're full of really weird chemicals you touch well, it you're you're dead well it's got weird things like mercury in it and you're like yeah. oh it'll be like mercury sulfur and i think a lot of it is sulfur uh and then it'll have like like lead and and or like lick like not liquid it'll be like like a vaporized version of lead and you're like oh that's not good yeah so like earth is an incredibly beautiful place it's an incredibly deadly place if you're not careful so i'm I'm very happy with my oxygen my o2 and my h2o and that's all i really need i'm I'm good with those and i'm good with whatever the chemical makeup is of shampoo (laughs) yeah exactly that's about it and 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 juice i'm okay with that too (laughs) we have remarkably simple lives but they keep us alive so we are just about done here on the weird news here on this we can geek.net but we are going to take a listen to one of my reviews where me alex my sister katie and blair all got together and played the latest edition of the jackbox party selection of games this is jack box party pack nine and when we come back guys we'll talk about what our piece of halloween programming is going to be uh this year because we've just had some scheduling conflicts but we got something really cool lined up for you we'll be back guys right after this only on this geek.net in a world of robots magic deception esp and reality tv you must use your phones as controllers to play the Jackbox Party Pack 9. Keep the party going with family and friends near or far. Hey guys, this is Mike the Birdman here, and I'm here to tell you about something that I always look forward to each and every single year. I'm talking about the latest version of the Jackbox Party Pack. We are looking at the ninth version of this. Man, can you believe it's been going on for this long? Once again, coming to us from Jackbox Games. This was reviewed on the Xbox Series. X. So what do we get in this edition of the latest and greatest party game pack that currently exists? Well, you get the latest version of Fibbage. If you can believe it's been a while since we've had that. I want to say like four or five years. Either way, it's been a damn long time. We also get a new game called Rumorang, which is kind of like Big Brother reality show. It's kind of like a role-playing type of thing where you take on a character that has like a defining trait. Um, one of my favorite games is a new one called Junktopia. Uh, you get one that's called Nonsensory, which is like a weird thing between guessing and drawing. It's strange. And my favorite game of this one is one that's called Quick Sort that has for that is meant to be played between one and 10 people. The fact that it can be played solo is I think kind of awesome. So let's get the obvious one out of the way. First is Fibbage any good. It always is. It's entertaining as it's always been. And we get cookie back, I think. So good going there. I'm always a big fan of the presentation of that game. It's a favorite for a reason. Rumorang. I didn't really like, which is weird because I like these type of things. Uh, Typically, anything that involves role playing, I get a chance to stretch my legs a little bit. Ha ha. um, And kind of play around with people. The problem is with this one, I had a bit of a hard time trying to wrangle together four people to play this kind of locally. We did play a little bit on my birthday, but this is the one game that nobody was really kind of vibing around. And we kind of quickly left this game on the cutting room floor, such as it may be. The one game that kind of surprised us the most was Junktopia. Basically, you've been cursed by this wizard who's, well, turned you into a frog. And in order to get your body back, well, you have to convince somebody to spend some money. So you go into this antiquity shop and buy three random stupid items. And uh, basically, you have to make a profit. So um, if you spend a hundred dollars, whatever you make in profit, you have to take away a hundred bucks. If you spend two hundred and fifty bucks, 
you get where I'm going with this. Um, I remember the first item I created was the uh, bust of disappointed parents. And I said, uh, you get like a couple of different prompts, like when it comes to defining its characteristics. I said, has the mighty mustache of the holy paladin Tom Selleck of the Royal Order of Blue Bloods by the Church of Magnum P.I. or something like that. Basically, I just threw as many Tom Selleck references in there as I could. Um, game is wonderfully voice acted, wonderfully animated. Had a really fun time with that one. Gotta say the presentation this year really went up a notch. non sensory it's kind of a weird kind of guessing game where you'll get a prompt, say... Give an answer. I, I know this was one of the ones that I want. Uh, give a text message that is a four out of ten in terms of importance. And I was like, uh, you forgot to pick up the mail on the way home or something like that. Um, I didn't like how there was a drawing element uh, in this one in particular, mostly because I'm terrible at drawing. I think the only drawing game I've liked, honestly was probably TKO, which is the uh, t-shirt game from a long time ago. And I didn't really kind of dig that one. So this one, the guessing part was fun when you could really get a bunch of people who are really, really into it. But um, I didn't have a, a lot of fun with that one. But I think with the right group of people, you could have some fun. My favorite game, without a doubt, hands down, is one called Quick Sort. And it's one we all get two categories and you can play on teams or you can play like one on three or whatever. And you might get like, hey, these characters appeared in a cartoon from what year? And you would sort from oldest to newest. And that was surprisingly fun. And it was really close. Me and my sister were on a team versus Alex and Blair. And the only reason they won, and I will defend this to the end, is they got a category that was based on cartoons, and we knew approximately where everything was. From Tom and Jerry to Beavis and Butthead to, like, Steven Universe or something, they got each and every one right, and they got, like, a massive point streak, and they beat us by literally a couple hundred points, Where where whereas me and my sister were dominating for most of the game. So is Jackbox Party Pack 9 worth it? Actually, I'm going to say, yeah. I mean, other than Rumerang being the weakest entry in this version, again, I like the fact that these games have certain lower requirements where you may only require as few as one player, which is wonderful. I wish more of these games would have uh, a solo play option, but you can also have as many as 10 players in in certain games. Like I said, Rumorang, I think, is the weakest one. I kind of hope maybe I can get more people to play it with me kind of locally. I find that's probably the most fun. But that's what I think of the Jackbox Party Pack uh, 9 available from Jackbox Game. Available on all major platforms. You should probably give this one a check out as if you're American, Thanksgiving is coming. And what better way to cool down the politics talk that will inevitably happen around your Thanksgiving table why the hell not? Or if you're doing a Halloween party coming up, why not? This could be a lot of fun. And don't forget, folks, the holidays are coming up. Yeah. What do you think about those controversial video games? I love them. All right, folks. So thank you for joining us here on This Week in Geek .net. Um, Once again, before we end the show, I just want to thank everybody who took the time out of their weeks to thank and wish me a happy, happy birthday. You guys gave me the best birthday I could have ever asked for. Like really seeing my sister come down from Montreal was such a treat. I'm so glad she's here. Um, having Blair make me feel like I'm nine years old again was such a thing. And then the Guelph storm and the fan club doing something extra special for me. That was it. This has been one of the best weeks I've had in years. So, and then your curmudgeon, a younger brothers is just going to be ignored and you're not going to mention him here, <laughs> <laughs> but no, no it, it, we had a great time, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I said, it was just, you, you, it, had, you had a spaghetti dinner. And I did. It, it was good. I, I really liked it. Yeah. Like there's just, I don't know. Just I'm, exceptionally thankful for everything that has happened in, in the last couple days. So like I said, thank you to everybody, but that brings me to what is going on for Halloween. So as you know, next Monday, the 31st is Halloween. So 
We have been promising some content here on the show for a little while. The thing is getting schedules. Now, I know with Aaron, it's just a matter of getting him uh, and I aligned right now, but I know he is dealing with some family stuff right now. So getting well, him around is a little bit more difficult. Well, and, and right he's been making appearances on um, Modifius Twitch streams and stuff for promoting the, the Star Trek books that he works on. So, but, so yeah, he, he's had some of those times he's, he's promoting that. And then it's uh, it's you know his day job and everything scheduling with us whereas you and i can do it pretty much whenever we have a time slot we we want to make sure that it's convenient for him and it's like nobody wants to record when they feel they have to (laughs) yeah exactly so we will get the uh future imperfect show out on cryptids i'm just not sure when and that means we were going to do a month long salute to John Carpenter. So me and Alex were talking before the show. We're gonna, we're going to condense it into something a little bit more interesting. And I've never watched these three movies in sequence to see what this is, but I've seen these movies a thousand times, but I love them to death. We're going to talk about John Carpenter's apocalypse trilogy. So that's th- the thing prince of darkness and finally in the mouth of madness so representing the the, do, the 1980s and the 1990s Sutter Kane? do you read yeah. Sutter Kane? do you read Sutter Kane? i love that and sam neil this is when i never realized his role was not just dr alan grant and then when i saw him in event horizon which came out a couple of years later after this i'm like wow See, like i really that- like him I'm that weirdo that I had Jurassic Park. Like my my cousins gave it to me for my birthday when it first came on VHS, which would would have been what like ninety four. Because I think they, I think you had to wait like late a year. 90, I think it was late ninety three. I think I had it for Christmas that year. Yeah, so my birthday's in February, so that would make sense. Uh, but that was not the first time I saw it. Saw it. So I was like seven, seven or eight when that when that came out. Right. Mm-hmm. I saw on TV uh, the movie that he did which is terrifying when i think about it but i you know i didn't care it was on tv i'm like i'll watch whatever this is and it was do you remember the movie dead calm heard of it yeah uh it is uh i believe i I hope i'm not misremembering it it's not a like mandela effect or something uh but it's i forget who the actress is with him but it's sam neill and his wife on a boat and billy zane is a crazed like uh sexual predator murderer that terrorizes them on the open seas. Well, then it's a really good movie. I I just haven't seen it in 25 years or more. Um, But that was my introduction to him. So like I saw him from that. It's also like how everybody knows Jeff Fahey from, uh, uh, I guess, Grindhouse. And I think he was in Lost. But I remember him because my we didn't have a lot of VHS tapes. but My parents had uh, uh, body parts. Oh, and, I remember that VHS cover. Very, and very I cool. had nightmares. <laughs> oh, boy. But, yeah. but yes, but, sorry. I just had to interject because it was one of those flashes of memory popped into my head. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, yeah. So before the end of the year, we are going to be having more loose cannons. We are planning a RPG that you will be able to listen to over the long winter months that uh, we're going to record hopefully in the month of November over the course of several uh, different sessions. So we'll be looking forward to that. And then next year, I know we are planning on a short uh, one or two shot Transformers game. We're going to be doing and maybe just some other fun stuff just to spread our wings and fly a little bit. It, it, unless it gets delayed or something, we'll probably be doing Brindlewood Bay, which is the one I've mentioned a few times. That's the kickstarted. Uh, you're part of a granny uh, book club who solves murder mysteries that are almost cath- like like Cthulhu style stuff in a, in a small little cozy town. Think Murder She Wrote meets Golden Girls meets uh, in the I Mouth th- of Madness. I think Alex. I think in honor of dear Miss Fletcher. I think the town you set our adventure in should be called Lansbury. Well, well, it's called it's called Brenda Wood Bay. Maybe it'll be the Lansbury Book Club. There we go. I like it. I love it. So, yeah, we will be doing a lot more fun things as the year starts to wind down. Like I said, our big holiday gift guide, we are already starting to get material in. So be looking forward to that later on. The month of November is coming up. We're going to have games like Pokemon. I should get my Call of Duty review code next week. Um, We've just 
it's going to be busy guys. So, you know, me and Alex sprint to the finish. I'm trying to finish school yeah. quickly so I can concentrate on everything. I've got so. stuff from PDP coming in. Uh, I've also got, you remember last year I covered that STEM kit that was putting together like a mini game console. You soldered it together. The idea was that it's like family's first uh, engineering kit. Uh, mm -hmm. They're sending another kit over to check out like a new version of something. It might be one of three different things. So I'm not sure yet, but it should be here in the next few days. Um, it's always nice to have like a, a fun thing for the guide. That's also educational and not, yeah. and when I say that, I mean, not lame educational. I mean like legit fun educational. And I've got some board games coming to us from Gale Force Nine, which will be fun because hey, nobody wants to go outside. But you know what? When you're when you've got your family and friends around, the holidays are a great time to get to get together and play board games because it's something you can do in a couple of hours. It's not Dungeons and Dragons, but we got that too because you know what? Your buddies are coming home from college, university, or wherever. What better time to play than after a nice turkey? turkey dinner sit down have a glass of wine and throw some dice so anyway guys for this week in geek.net we have been alex the producer i've been mike the Birdman, saying be excellent to each other we'll catch you guys again next week right here on this week in geek.net at no point in your rambling incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.